Chapter 13. The Search for a Mysterious Drug After dinner one evening, Mr. Utterson was reading when his butler entered to say that Poole was in the hall, asking to speak with him most urgently. Show him in, of course, said the lawyer. Poole entered the parlor, his face pale and his body trembling. Bless me, Poole, said Mr. Utterson. What's the matter? You look ill. Or is the doctor ill? Come closer to the fire. Mr. Utterson, cried Poole, there is something very wrong. First, calm yourself, said the lawyer. Sit down, here's a glass of wine. Then take your time and tell me what the trouble is. Utterson was long used to handling agitated clients. Poole obeyed him. You know the doctor's ways, Mr. Utterson, sir, how he keeps to his office, shuts himself completely away, he does, and, and now I'm afraid, and, and that's the truth of it. Afraid? asked Utterson. Of what? Poole ignored the question. I've been afraid for a week now, his voice rose. I can't bear it any longer. None of us can. Utterson spoke a little sharply. Poole, tell me exactly what you fear. Poole raised frightened eyes to the lawyer's questioning ones. Foul play, Mr. Utterson. I think there's been foul play. Utterson could get no details from the usually calm, controlled, clear-thinking butler. The man was now so terrified. All he could do was plead that Utterson should come and see for himself. At once, Utterson called for his hat and coat, noticing the relief that swept Poole's face as he did so. It was a wild, cold night in March. The moon was pale, lying on its back as if the wind had tilted it. The wind made talking difficult, so Poole said nothing more, and Mr. Utterson remained unprepared for what he had to face. But the anticipation of disaster made him hurry. Poole knocked softly at Jekyll's front door. The door opened, but a chain was still fastened. A woman's voice asked, Is that you, Poole? That's right. Open the door. They entered a brightly lit hall with a fire roaring in the grate. A huddled group of people turned anxious faces towards them, and Utterson saw they were Jekyll's servants. A housemaid was weeping uncontrollably, and Jekyll's cook ran to him, clasping her hands and crying, Bless God! It's Mr. Mr. Utterson! Come to help us! What is all this? demanded the lawyer. Why are you idling in the hall? Poole spoke up for all. We're afraid, he said. Then taking a candle, he added, Please, sir, follow me to the laboratory. Make no noise, but just listen. And if Dr. Jekyll should want to see you, don't go in. Though amazed at this advice, Utterson did not comment. He quietly followed Poole up the stairs to the office. Poole knocked, saying, Sir, Mr. Utterson is asking to see you. He cautioned the lawyer to tell, to listen by raising his hand to his ear. A voice from within the office said, Tell him I cannot see anyone. Thank you, sir, replied Poole, and they hastily retraced their steps. Now, Mr. Utterson, was that my master's voice? Utterson hesitated. It's changed. Changed? I should think so, cried Poole. My master is dead, but who is in that office pretending to be Dr. Jekyll? Him that murdered him eight days ago. We heard the master cry out then, calling upon God. After that, the strange voice started answering to my knock and giving out orders. Mr. Utterson wiped his forehead, for anxiety was making him perspire. This is a wild tell you, tell me, Poole. Why would a murderer remain behind after he's done his killing? It's not reasonable. I can answer that, sir, said Poole. Him or it, or whatever is living now in that office, has been demanding some special medicine night and day. Dr. Jekyll always had a habit of writing out orders to the chemist and throwing the paper out on the stairs for me. Well, this past week there's been nothing but sheets of paper, and me running back and forth to different wholesale chemists. Utterson shrugged. An important experiment must be in the making. There's nothing odd about that, is there? Wait, sir, I haven't finished. None of these medicines I bring back is the right one. Soon there's another paper to another chemist, along with an order to return the drug I just brought home. This medicine is wanted most urgently, as you can see. Have you any of these papers? asked Utterson. Poole searched his pockets and brought out a crumpled sheet. Bending closer to the candle, Mr. Utterson read, Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments to Mrs. Ma, chemists. I wish to inform you that your last sample was impure. Two years ago, I purchased a large quantity of the same drug, and I desire the same good quality as I received then. Please search your warehouse for more of that same lot. Expense is no object. Up to this point, the letter was very carefully written and in a professional tone, but now the writer's emotions spilled over, for the handwriting became unsteady, and the words read, For God's sake, find me some of the old. Mr. Utterson looked up from the paper. This is most disturbing, but the letter is not sealed. Are you daring to open his letters? 
Oh no, sir. I delivered it sealed, but the man at Moore's got angry when he read it and threw it back at me like so much dirt. He said Dr. Jekyll was to stop bothering them, for they had sent their best to him, and were not used to having it rejected. The lawyer looked harder at the paper in his hand. I would say that this letter was unquestionably written by Dr. Jekyll. Do you deny this, Poole? Poole sighed. No, sir. It, it does seem very like his hand. But now I must tell you the worst part. I have seen this person, this thing, in the office. It slipped out to dig among crates and laboratory, just as I came in through the garden entrance. Mr. Edison was very still. I'm listening, Poole. He looked up when I came in and gave a funny kind of cry. Then he went right up the stairs and back into the office. He slammed the door something awful. Poole's voice lowered, a note of horror creeping into it. Why would my master have covered his face from me? Why would he have cried out like a rat and run from me? Poole threw out his hands in a show of bewilderment. Mr. Edison tried to hang on to common sense logic, which a lawyer was trained to do. I grant you these are odd circumstances, Poole, but it must be that Dr. Jekyll has fallen in with a sickness that has tortured and deformed him. That is the reason for covering his face, for the strangeness of his voice, for his avoidance of his friends, and, of course, he is desperately searching for a cure. So sends you from chemist to chemist. All this is natural to my way of thinking. Now Poole drew himself up and spoke out firmly, almost defiantly, with none of his usual humility and politeness. No, sir, I say not. What I saw was a dwarf, not the tall, fine person of my master. That thing is not Dr. Jekyll. How could it be? No, I tell you, Dr. Jekyll has been murdered. To that I'll swear. For two long minutes, Addison thought it over. Finally, he said, Poole, if your belief is that strong, there's only one thing to do. We must go back into the house and get some tools and break down the door to the office.